All right, everyone, welcome back to CIS 126. We're in week seven of the summer, week three of the class, but week seven of the summer. And we've got the, um, the game stuff now to start to talk about. You're all going to be working on your animation project, of course. That's due at the end of the month on the 30th. So there's still plenty of time for you to work on it there. But we are still going to move on to the next topics, which is gaming. And that'll be the starting point today and Wednesday to kind of ease into, well, how do we even set up Adobe Animate to create an interactive game project? So that'll be the lecture. There's going to be an assignment that's based on a podcast. Uh, so tell me there in the chat or here in person if you do, if you listen to any podcasts if that is something that you consume content from, uh, podcasts are a great way to also learn and uh, keep up to date with things. They are usually these weekly shows that you can subscribe to and you get some um, comedy stuff. I know there's a lot of like true crime podcasts out there that are very popular. Comedy, knowledge, uh, gaming podcasts, keeping up today with the latest news on gaming, for example. So lots of podcasts. We're going to look at a podcast uh, from a gaming company that's been around 30 years. And uh, one of their head designers puts out a podcast every week, I think twice a week, about making games and making their specific game. And so that designer puts out a lot of information, tips on game making games. So there'll be an assignment about listening to a couple of episodes of his podcast and then writing a little bit about it. I'll explain that in a moment. That's gonna get us into then the um, next weeks of uh, actually working with uh, programming to make a game. Now I'll show examples from previous semesters about games that have been previously made because in order to for everyone to be able to be on the same page, it's not that everyone is going to be able to make their own kind of game. Well, I want to make an FPS. I want to make an MMORPG. I want to make a you know puzzle quest style game or whatever, Flappy Bird and such. It's going to be that everyone kind of works on the same type of game uh, with your own original characters that you've been devising that maybe is a continuation of your movie project. A lot of people, what they do in the previous semesters is they, they make their movie project and it kind of ends on a to be continued. Well, the to be continued part is then what this game could be. This point and click game that we're going to, I'm gonna show you examples of, that we're gonna learn little by little how to make our own version. And then that'll be the next big final project, your version of a point and click game little adventure kind of game. Before that, we need to see how Adobe Animate can let us create interactive projects. So we're going to use something called Adobe Air. I forget what it stands for at the moment. Adobe Interactive Runtime, maybe. Something like that. And what Air will allow us to do is create projects that are deployable to Android and iOS devices. So you're going to be able to make these interactive projects, these games that will run on your real devices, uh, tablets, phones, iPhone, Android. So we need to learn how all of that is set up before we can actually make games and stuff. And I've got a note here about you'll, be, you'll need to do something here. I'll explain that in the lecture in a moment. And then uh, the podcast, listening to these two specific podcast episodes and then a little homework on it. So as usual, we've got the Mondays and Wednesdays for lecture time for lab time. And this is when I definitely recommend that if you prefer to do the class at home, that's fine. But I highly recommend that you do come to the lab time in the next few weeks, because the programming side of things, well, the interactive side of things, which lets you make games is based on programming. And programming is a different sort of mentality. It's a little less artistic. Many of you that take these classes are really in it because you're very artistic. I, I look around at your homework and I see very well-drawn characters, great ideas in your writing and such. And to make a game requires 
uh, there's the right, the left brain, the right brain, one is the artistic side, one is the logical side, whatever that is supposedly. So the one side of the brain that is a little bit more logical, that a little is a little bit more, uh, you know, thinking rather than feeling, you're going to need the thinking side of your brain for these next assignments. Therefore, it's going to be very beneficial to come to class because I can give you help, the assistants can give you help, and it is going to be that, you know, you'll see here how the computers are soulless, the computers are relentless, they have no pity, because if you program it wrong, it won't work. And it's not just one command that is wrong, it could be one character. You could put a comma instead of a period, and then nothing will work. The one character could break, you know, the one, the one symbol could break your whole game. So you're going to gain an appreciation for games that are buggy and this has another patch released and such because gaming is hard and especially when you are the only person in your company that is making this game you've got to take care of it all the drawing of it the story of it the um, uh, programming of it the testing of it and such debugging it as we've got there in the in the chat a colon versus a semicolon. They're both completely different things, even though they, they look 99% the same, but they are very different. And if you use one or the other in the wrong place, everything breaks, it doesn't work. So lab time, we've got a whole room here full of people to help. Uh, and I definitely recommend you take advantage of that. It is gonna be harder to give tech support from home because there's the lag time of going back and forth and maybe setting up a Zoom meeting and such. And definitely this is when uh, we have the assistants. The assistants can also help via Zoom. And so if you are going to need some help, contact me, I'll get you in touch with the assistants. And then they can also Zoom with you because it's a lot easier than going back and forth via the Canvas inbox or come in person here in the nice air conditioned room and you can also work here. All right, so the resources. There's a section on Adobe Air resources. The first one is very important. You're going to need to do this at home. I will demonstrate how to do this here in the lab in a moment. There's some long documentation about Adobe Air that I'll use that for the lectures. You can browse that if you want. And then eventually, well, your game, your project is going to go on real devices. Here's a couple of readings there, which of course I will demonstrate. Making a game is a big endeavor and it's not just, I have a great idea for a game and the programming of it. You have to sort of start at step zero on sort of the why of things, a little bit of the how of things and then actually doing it. So here is a 10 things every game needs. This is a series, this is, a, this is an article plus a series of podcasts, which is about 30 minutes long each or so. And uh, this is, uh, these are published by Mark Rosewater. This is, a, uh, this is a person that's been involved in making games for about 30 years now. He works at the company Wizards of the Coast, which is part of Hasbro. Wizards of the Coast is famous for making that game Magic the Gathering. So originally it was a paper card game, then a digital game. It's bigger than ever. They recently published uh, their version of the Lord of the Rings set of magic. So you could play as Gandalf and such. And so he's been around making games for almost 30 years. And he publishes a podcast to a week or so about making games in general, making magic in specific, the theories of game design and such. And a few years ago, he made up a series of podcasts called The 10 Things Every Game Needs. So in the assignment, I'll explain it in the assignment, you're going to listen to one required podcast, the main episode. It's about 30 or 40 minutes long. Actually, let me see it directly. It is 31 minutes, 11 seconds. So you need to listen to that one, set aside 30 minutes to listen to it and not just have it in the background while you're doing the dishes. You do want to listen to what he's saying. And in there, he talks about the 10 things. He then later made episodes for each of those 10 things that go on in detail, about 30 minutes or so. The second half of the homework, as I'll show in a moment, you also have to pick one of the other 10 things and listen to one of those. 
Now, these 10 things are things that you probably, possibly are going to consider putting in your game. And even if it's not this game, it's for future games, future projects you may work in, future teams of game developers you may be in. These 10 things make a successful game. So these resources for us here, being able to make games in Adobe Animate, step zero about working on a project of a game, and then the actual hands-on is what's coming this week and the next week's about learning this in, uh, in class to make your own game. Specific, the assignment, again, as I said, you do have the deadline of the homework, which everyone voted for the 30th. But in the meantime, you're also going to have an assignment or two in between. And here's one of the in-between ones. Everything I just said about this. Um, I've got a link there to the main archive of all 1,050 episodes. He's been doing this podcast for a while, two episodes per week. Divide that in two. That's 500 episodes or so, or 500 weeks. Divide that into 52 weeks, I guess. That's 10, 10 years. He's been doing this podcast for 10 years. And uh, all of the episodes are, are there. You can check them all out on that first link. But for the assignment, make sure you listen to episode 11. The direct link is right there. If you want to on your own podcast app, if you've got Spotify, Pandora, et cetera, you can find his podcast. It's called Drive to Work. You can ask Alexa to play it for you or Siri or whatever specifically episode 11, listen to that one. Uh, listen to it, make any notes, whatever. Uh, just kind of think about what he's saying. And he mentions these 10 things. Goals, rules, interactions, catch-up features, inertia, surprise, strategy, fun, flavor, and a hook. Uh, these 10 things come together to make a good game. He then goes on to specific episodes on a specific topic. Select any one of those 10 and also listen to it. You can find the direct link over from this first um, item here. You can find it on your podcast app if you want. The number is right there. Listen to it, take notes, mental notes, listen carefully and such. And then what you're gonna do in any word processor, Microsoft Word, Apple Pages, Google Docs, whatever, in any Word processor, text editor, I suppose, plain old notepad if you want. Going to write, first of all, in your own words, explain what those 10 things mean. These 10 goals in one sentence, tell me what you think it means based on listening to his first episode. He explains it. So then in your words, explain what that is. And then select any one of the 10, listen to the episode completely. And then consider how would you, how could you, what's a possibility for you to use that technique in a game that you would make? It's not that you have to do that for this game you're making in class. It's just that in the theory, if I wanted to apply the concept of a hook, how might you do that in a game that you might make one day or the one in this class? So then you uh, save that as a PDF, then you upload it to Canvas. And that's this week's assignment. So no, no programming or anything like that is due, but you're going to listen to a couple of podcasts to get these ideas for the theories of programming or of game design, and then do a little writing on it. That makes sense. Tell me in the chat, yes, no. Does that kind of make a little sense at the moment? Obviously, if you need help, contact me or the assistant so we can help. But this is a different, this is a little bit of a difference from previous assignments. It's it's uh it's not a big creative assignment like we've been doing the whole semester. It's a little bit of a more thoughtful type of assignment. And like I said, we've got very creative assignments that we've been doing, and then other sort of programmatic or logical assignments that are coming up. All right, good. So let me move on here. Open up Adobe Animate to start to talk about, well, how do I even set myself up to make games with Adobe Animate? We're going to talk about setting up the project properly. We're going to talk about 
what kind of project this is and its features and the like. We're going to talk about ActionScript, which is the coding language built into Adobe Animate so that we can do interactive things. Talk about deploying the projects to real devices. If you get all of this working, you'll be able to start to publish some quick test projects and such onto your devices. You'll be able to show your friends and family, hey, look, I'm working on a game. It's a real game. Check it out on my device. And eventually when you learn what you need to learn in this class, you will be able to publish a real game that you could publish to the real app stores and start getting rich 99 cents at a time. So here's, uh, here's our first steps here. So we've previously worked with this full HD template, which is focused on creating an HD quality movie. We don't want, um, we don't want that type of project. We've also got these other, uh, other types of projects like an Android project, an iPad project, etc. But I'm going to go over to the create new, create new icon on the left. Is up our templates. Looking at character animation tab at the top, we've also got these other ones, social, game, education, et cetera, and advanced. Over on advanced is what we want to work with. Under advanced, we have further templates here, and three of them are listed as Air, Air for desktop, iOS, and Android. So the thing is, you can make projects here interactive projects that are for desktop, you can make apps that are games that can be published as real apps that run on a real computer that would get installed on the real computer and be part of part of a, a, a real game sort of thing. You also have it for iOS, for iPhones, and then also for Android devices. So hidden here under the many types of projects that Animate can create, is advanced. And to be able to teach this, even though if you might have an iPhone, to teach this and to learn this and to follow along, you want to select Android. Because especially if you're here in person, we have uh, Android tablets, a whole set of them in our cabinet that we can check out to you, just like our, our uh, drawing tablets. We have these Android tablets that are ready to go. You don't have to do any settings or whatever on your own device. Um, our devices are ready to go and they're you know a little bit bigger tablets. And so the um, for the learning of it all, you do want to select Android. And the first thing we'll see on the right side here, if if you've if you've set this up for the very first time using Adobe Animate for the first time, I mean, it's going to say AirDK is no longer. Uh, shipped with anime in order, uh, please refer to the following. So there's a link here, which is the same link that I've got for you on Canvas when I note it over on the resources. On the welcome message, there's a link right here. Now, either way you get to it, you click on Enable Air, it should open up a window. If it doesn't look like it opened the window, I often see that it opens up behind Animate for some reason. So click it one time, and if nothing seems to happen, don't click on it again, but open the browser. It should be there waiting for you. And so we need this add-on to be installed, and it's free, uh, but it's an extra step because not everyone is going to make games. Uh, so it's not installed because it's an extra one gigabyte or so to install, and so it's not added by default. Now, in these labs, in the room, you don't have to download it. We've already got it for you. I'll show that in a moment. But at home, you will need to do this. I'll, I'll go through the steps. But there's one, two, three. And basically on number one, there's a link there. It tells you a bunch of stuff. Great, I agree. Click accept. And then from here, you have to choose, okay, do I want the Windows version, the Mac version, or the Linux version? So here in the lab again, you don't have to download any of these. I've got it ready for you. At home, depending on what kind of computer you have, you obviously select the one that you need. Let's say I have a Mac at home, you would click that and it would download a big old zip file. 
I'm not really going to download it in the lecture here. But there at home, you would get a, a zip file, either on Windows or Mac. When it finishes download it, you, downloading, you have to unzip it. As the instructions say here, you're going to download this file. It's going to be about a gigabyte or something. You're going to extract it on the Mac. It should automatically unzip itself on Windows. You'll have to right-click, select Extract. That unzipped file, you need to put it somewhere on your computer, on your desktop, in your Documents folder, leave it in the Downloads folder, I guess. Just don't forget to not, just don't forget to not, not delete it. You're going to need this file. Um, in these computers here, the file's ready to go for you. If you minimize everything uh, and you go to the this PC on the C drive, there's an air SDK file. So we've already downloaded it. We've already extracted it. For all of you at home, at some point, you'll need to do this. You don't have to do it now. It takes a moment. But at some point, you download this huge file. You unzip it. And then you move it somewhere. I would recommend put it on your C drive or maybe in the program files folder somewhere that you'll find it. I don't recommend to leave it in your downloads folder or on the desktop. Just put it somewhere, probably on your C drive. And what's in that folder is a bunch of stuff. You don't have to worry about it, but you need the folder unzipped. If it still has a little zipper icon, you need to right click it and extract. Well, all of that effort was when I tried to create an Android file, it says, okay, you need that extra, you need that extra, um, that extra app kind of in order for this kind of file to be activated. So the instructions say, okay, download it, extract it, then in animate, go to the help menu. There's, an icon, there's a menu item that says Manage Adobe Air SDK. And then we're going to add that unzipped file to animate so that then now I can create the game project that I want. So here on Animate, it won't let me select a game project yet. So I'll cancel that. Go up to the Help menu. Go to Manage Adobe Air SDK. It says, okay, where did you unzip your file to? So I will add that unzipped file. In these labs, yes, you'll need to do this every time you come in here, because remember, Deep Freeze forgets. At home, you'll only need to do it once. But here, it's in my C drive. It's this Air SDK folder, so click that, and then I'll say select it. Should then say, yep, you've got version 50226 or whatever version number. I don't know if there will be a 51.29 whatever next week, whatever it is. Um, this is the one we've got ready to go. If 5232 is the latest one, when we downloaded this, we got 5226. 5232 is the latest one. So whatever number it happens to be is the right one. So now this says, okay, we see the extra apps, the extra templates, the extra features. Click okay on that. No need to restart, it should just work, but if you exit animate and restart it, sure, but it should work right away now. If I go back to create new, and then I switch over to the advanced templates, select Air for Android. Again, if you've got an iPhone at home, uh, that's fine, but for learning it and showing it, I'm gonna be showing the Android version. They're equivalent. They both end up with a game by the end. And if you come to per in person in the lab, you'll get um, 
you, you get to borrow a tablet here. You have these dimensions. This is for a vertical game, right? 480 wide, 800 tall. So it's gonna be a taller game. If you wanted a landscape game, you would flip those around. 800 by 480, we'll leave those for the moment. Frame rate 24, unit pixels. So nothing to change there. Notice on the iPhone and then desktop. So nothing really to change. And you get a little info here. Creates assets and adds interactivity for apps for Android versus iOS versus for cross-platform desktop. Windows or Mac computers. Linux too, I guess. So for this class, we want Air for Android. For this week, as we're learning it, later on in the semester, you can uh, go with iOS, but for the moment, just to learn it, Android. Click Create. And two, press Control Two to zoom out. I'll change my background color as usual, just an off white. I'm going to save this file. Create a folder, then save it. Create a new folder for week seven, then we'll save it. And you can save it with today's date. We have this file. Now, I want to uh, set up some very simple thing uh, and then kind of show you something new. So uh, I'm just gonna make a, uh, I'm gonna make like a little face, a little character or whatever, and I'm just gonna make it spin. Uh, so just a face. In order to make it spin, I'll have I'll make it as a symbol, and then I'll tween it to spin. So for the symbol to work, I need to um, for the animation to work, I need to turn it into a symbol. So I drew whatever. It's a little small. Let me make it a little larger. Remember that whole size of your screen. Eventually, that'll be the size of a device. So you have this full size of a device. Might as well make it a little larger. Turn that into a symbol, F8. I don't know, C-A-R, it's a character, underscore face guy. Little rotation point from the center. It's a movie clip. And I want to take about two seconds or so. We'll go to frame 50, F6. I want there to be a change. The change will be rotation. Um, so with the uh, free transform tool, actually maybe with mathematically over on the uh, transform screen. So I'll put it 300. There's a little rotation there, uh, 355. So with a classic tween, do 180, I guess. The rotation here. kind of some kind of movement. I just want to have something <clears throat> I want to have some kind of animation for two frames. 
or uh, two uh, two seconds. So now the 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 kind of the new thing to to learn here, I can now start to see my project either on a real device or on the simulator. It's best, of course, on a real device. If you're in person, I will give you a real device in a moment. And if you're there at home, there's a little bit of a setup to connect your real device. Actually, assistance. If you could look up for me uh, how to activate ADB on Android, uh, find that for me, please. Uh, assistance, so how to activate ADB on Android. So here in person, I'll give you a um, tablet in a moment. But if I go up to the control menu, we've got test movie, and now we've got uh, in air debug launcher desktop, in air debug launcher mobile, and on device. So in a moment, I'll show this, but you're going to be able to plug in on USB your device into your computer and then test movie on USB. And your project will then get output onto a real device. That needs a little bit of setup, which I'll cover in a moment. And let's say I don't have access to a device. Let's say I don't have the cable. You have to do this through the cable. It's not going to do it through Wi-Fi. And let's say I can't do it on a real device at the moment. So we've got these two sort of simulators, desktop and mobile. This project is supposed to be a mobile project. So I will select control test movie on air debug launcher mobile. I'm going to click that one. to remote network which is not supported. Oh, okay, because I'm saving this on the network. Whoops, okay, let me do this. Let me save this not on the network to my desktop. That's funny that it wouldn't let that stipulation. So you're not going to have to worry about that. Mine is being um, done on a network. And I got a link here. Let me check if this is it. Enable deep ADB on your device. Yes, this is, a, this is it exactly. Thank you. So there's a uh, there's a link there in the chat if you if you want to for I'll sh th I'll explain this in a moment but if you've got an Android device and you want to connect it so that it works on your Android device which I'll show in a moment you're going to have to first enable a setting on your device and then it will connect but I'll show that in a moment we got the link there from the assistance great I will also put it into Canvas I forgot to add that. Say here, enable debug Android. Add a little later. Get back to that. So, uh, okay. So I was about to control to uh, test movie onto the D debug launcher mobile. See some stuff pop up in a moment. You should also see see that this device is this is showing like a device, like a vertical phone like a handheld phone. And it's supposed to also pop up with a, oh, here it is, it's on my other screen. Uh, it's also gonna pop up with this controller over here, the simulator controller that is divided into various sections, accelerometer, touch and gesture, geolocation. So even if you don't have a real device, you can simulate your projects on this, where you can even sort of like click it and drag it. Well, what if I was tilting my device, X and Y and Z coordinates? What if I was clicking on the device, like in real life, I would just tap it with 
uh, with my finger. I have that ability here via the simulator touch layer. And then now I have this sort of like finger where I can tap on things, or I can simulate, click and drag how big my finger is, pressure, et cetera. I have geolocation. If I'm making an app that taps into location, maybe this game, like what's the big famous one, Pokemon Go, if you're at a location and there's, hey, Charizard is right over there. So I, I want to take a picture or capture it, whatever. I can set coordinates here, X and Y coordinates, even height and such, and how fast you're moving and such. You can pop up the menu it, on your Android device. You, you have an icon or uh, a button for your menu. You can open the menu. You have your back button on your Android device. So we have this simulator. A real device is better, but for a quick test on a simulator here, I can create my project. And again, this is gonna be a game. I'm gonna be able to tap it and move it. And that character is gonna run around and blast it with lasers and stuff. It's gonna be an interactive thing. Right now it's just spinning. But what I'm showing here is we've got this brand new way to check our projects, window or debug, um, or sorry, control test movie on the, on the launcher there. I close these. I go back to animate. To animate and make any changes to the symbol, and then again test that simulator. So this is going to be very cool. We'll be able to, oh, I forgot to say, uh, on these computers, it didn't do it. But at home, probably the very first time on your Windows computer, when you run this simulator, probably for the first time, it'll pop up with allow the firewall. You want to say yes. You want to click OK on that uh, in order for the firewall to work properly and for the game to be simulated. So it didn't do it on mine. It didn't do it on these computers because this lab is already set up, ready to go. Right, so. This is something brand new. We are going to start to make these projects that are going to be interactive. There's no, inter there's no interactivity just yet. I'm going to get to that. We're still setting up a basic project so that we can do interactivity. The big idea was, of course, you need to make sure you download the Android SDK file. You need to connect it to animate. You need to create the right type of file. People always make this mistake at the very beginning here. You, you create a project, you work on it, and it just doesn't work. Well, you selected the wrong one. We're not working with this HD character animation anymore. We're working with an advanced air project. It's the number one thing be in that type of project in order for you to be able to do the next assignments. So we get used to changing the project type there. Now you're gonna get used to either testing your movie on a simulator like I just showed or on a real device. So I'll show real device. Let me pause though. Does that make sense? If you're there at home, any questions here so far? It makes kind of sense so far is opening up a whole new area of using Adobe Animate to make these interactive projects. The next level up would be, I wanna see this on a real device. Now we're gonna set up here in the, in the lab, we're gonna set up a little bit more and then I'll hand out tablets for you to actually see this on a real device. Here's the next setup. File menu, Air, Android settings. So let's go up to the file menu. Let's select Air Android Settings. 
it's going to pull up a screen with a lot of little tabs and I'll have, and I'll explain them all. Uh, we need to know all of these tabs in order for us to set up our project to make games. Uh, let's see. Yeah, we'll just go left to right, I guess. So general output file. Eventually, when this is finally, full, then the game is fully finished and you publish it or you convert it. Well, when we were dealing with a plain old graphic, the graphic might have been a JPEG file type or a GIF file type or a ping file type. When we were dealing with the movie project, remember we, if you do the extra credit, you're exporting it as an MP4 file. So here for Android, it's an APK file, an Android package file. If you do the iPhone export, I believe it's an IPA, an iPhone what it stands for. And so this is going to have some file name, which is based on whatever you called your, your file. Mine is 717FLA, and it's going to export as that. You can save this as anything else like my game. So I'm not going to make any changes, but I'm just showing you here, APK. App name. Well, eventually, this is going to be a real app on a real device. And when you look at a real app on a real device, it has its name. It has an icon and it has a name below it. The name below it is right here. So if I wanna call this my amazing game, then that's the name that's going to appear on the, uh, below the icon installed on the device. I'm not gonna make any changes at the moment, but that's what app name does. App ID is just a unique identifier behind the scenes. It'll be called air.whatever, the name of your file. You can change this, you can leave it the same, whatever, doesn't matter. You can't put spaces though, so it'd be best lowercase, no spaces. But the thing is that um, the, um, this package name right here, this app ID is a unique name. I'm going to leave it as is. You can set your version number, any version you want. This is my first version of the game. Sometimes as you're working at the, at the very beginning, maybe you're setting like a lower number here. It's version 0 0.1. As I add a new feature, I'll update this to 0 0.2. When it's ready to almost ready to publish, it's at 0.9. When I publish it to the real world, it's a 1.0. So um, change that if you want. Version label, don't worry about that. Just leave that blank. And we've got here aspect ratio. Okay, my app is currently a portrait, a vertical game. So if I wanna make a game that is vertically to interact with vertically, great. If I want to make the game landscape, I can set it landscape. But then I have to also change the dimensions of my file. So I'll come back to that in a moment. Or automatically, whatever, when the game starts, if a person was holding their phone landscape, it starts landscape. When they started the game, if they were vertical, it starts vertical. So auto, if you choose any one of those, and then auto orientation, it will then automatically rotate in any direction. So. I'm not going to change anything just yet. Also, I'll leave it portrait, no auto, leave that. By default, on an, when you have any, device, any app running on a device, you have your top bar where it tells you your Wi-Fi and battery. You probably have your bottom bar with your various icons. If instead you want your game to take up the full screen, you have there an icon, full screen. So that makes sense. These bottom ones are advanced, but you don't need to do anything here. Do you want this to use your CPU of the device, the GPU, the direct processor, I think? What sort of processor on the device? Again, none of this do you really need to change. It's all gonna work just fine. Uh, most devices are ARM-based anyway, and there's other stuff. So nothing really to change here. This basic one should work with everything and such. If you're making a very complex game, 
and you know that your game is going to go on very new advanced devices, you might make some changes, but these defaults should work with everything. I didn't make any changes, but if you, as you make changes in these, in these screens, I would recommend to click OK. Even though I didn't make any changes, I'll just still click OK. And then save. Back to the settings. There's some more tabs to look at. Skip deployment for a moment. I'm going to go to icons. Here's what you set up your icon for your game. When it's running on a real device, it needs an icon so you know what you're tapping on. And here we have these various sizes. So in Photoshop or Microsoft Paint or Adobe Animate, you make um, an icon and you could make one icon and, and then apply it to all of these. So you would select which size and then you would find the icon. It would show you, this is what it looks like. You could make one and use it for all of them. That's fine. But they give you the, the chance to make different ones for different sizes. Because let's say you've got someone is downloading your game on a brand new phone with the highest resolution, brand new. You probably want a really nice looking high quality icon for these two large sizes. Maybe someone is downloading your game on, a, on an older device, smaller screen, lower pixels. So then you've got the two lower sizes. And often with the lower sizes, you make a simpler version of the icon because the screen is smaller. So instead of having you know, three letter initials, you have one letter. And then on the high quality one, you've got the three letters plus the shine and the glow and everything. And then the two in the middle are sort of like the middle quality. So sort of like your low quality icons, the first two your medium quality icons, the second two, and then your high quality icons, the last two. Change here at the moment, but eventually I will. I'll jump over to languages. So here you can say, what language is my app in? You do have to select at least one. So probably English or whatever you want. But make sure you do so we're not setting any icons at the moment. We're not setting general at the moment, but on language, at least select one language. You do need to set this at some point, so I'll set it now. Save that. Back to settings. Options. So <clears throat> what would you like your device to be able to access? Sorry, what, what would you like your game to be able to access of your device? I want my game to be able to access the internet, to connect and download the latest updates or whatever. Or I want my game to be able to record audio, et cetera, et cetera. I believe just for testing purposes, as we're still learning, I believe we need at least internet at the moment. I'll double check that in a moment, but at least turn this one on. You can turn them all on if you want, uh, but at the least under permissions, set internet. Oh yeah, you need at least internet so you can do debugging. When we're running the device and it's, when we're running the, the game on your device and it's causing errors, we need to see what those errors are. And so the internet permission allows you to connect to the device to see the errors. Click OK on that. Save. Back to settings. So general language permission icon. Deployment. There's several things here. Let's say first at the bottom. This, this setting screen is important for two reasons, to set your settings, but then to publish the app eventually to actually um, create the game file later. And here we've got, after you publish it, after all the settings are correct, 
install it on the connected device, well, I don't have anything plugged in, but imagine if my device was plugged in, it would then pop up here. You've got your Android phone, your Samsung, whatever plugged in. And then I have launch application on the connected device. So once in a moment, when I pass out tablets here in the classroom, we'll come back to the screen here and we'll say, yeah, install it on a device and then start the game on the device. We'll do that in a moment. But this is the screen here under deployment. It's an error runtime. Don't worry about this. This is fine. Then we've got deployment, device release, debug. Don't worry about this at the moment. That certificate plus password. This will be for later. Once the game is finished, we can um, publish it to the real world. But then you have to confirm that I'm the creator. This is my certificate. This is my proof that it's my game. We'll get back to that a little bit later. But these are these, this is deployment tab, very important. Click OK on that and save. Yep, on our first break here, so we'll take a break. I'm going to pass out tablets here in person, then we'll be back because now I want to see this on my real device. We'll do that right after the break. It's 1.03. We'll take a break 10 minutes. We'll be back at 1.13, and I'll show the next steps about adding this to a real device.
All right, everyone, so I'm gonna go on. So I've got myself here an Android tablet. We have these to check out. If you join us in the room, in the lab. And so I'm gonna turn this on. So this is uh, just some generic Asus Android tablet, nine inch, eight inch, something like that. And these are ready to go in the lab. And so the idea is I'm gonna go through the steps about, okay, I want to um, put this amazing project on my device. Now at home, it won't be as direct as what I'm about to show because I've already set up a little bit in the lab. And at home, once you set this up, then it'll be totally easy. So the link that was given there in the uh, in the chat, if you got an Android device, you have to enable debugging mode. So let's see. To go right here, enable developer options, depending on your device, you might see a developer options menu item right away. Most likely you won't. Android is cool in that it is can be for regular people or it could be for advanced people. And we're advanced people because we're about to put a game onto our device directly. Well, that means developer options. It might be hidden by default. So you have to follow one more series of steps here, enable developer options. Depending on your device, for example, if you've got a Google Pixel versus an HTC, whatever, you might have to go to these various settings. So basically, there's a build number on your Android device. And you have to tap it seven times, and then it'll pop up with, you are now a developer, which will then activate the developer options. Once the developer option is active, you'll be able to enable USB debugging. It'll be an icon on the menu. Yeah, and I, in the developer options, there'll be an icon that says enable USB debugging. So the whole idea is that if you have an Android phone at home, to turn on the USB debugging, which is found in the developer options, which needs to be activated by pressing the build number seven times, check the document there on how it's done on yours. Or also that's why you come here in person and we can help you in person to figure it out. Once that mode is active, then you'll be able to plug in with a USB, device, a USB cable to the, uh, to the device and you'll be able to deploy the, the app, your project to a real device. For the iPhone, it's slightly different. That's why I've also got under the resources deploying for iOS. There's a little reading there to do there. Check that out there for a moment on your own. And uh, I'll get back to that. That's why in class here, I'm gonna show the Android version because we've got Android tablets here. And so what you want to do here, yeah, just go ahead and turn it on. There's a power button on the side there. When it turns on in a moment, uh, you'll be on track with what I'll show you. So the, uh, the deployment is uh, once you take a couple of steps to first set it up, it uh, then will work just very easily. So on these computers, we do have a left side USB port, which you might be using for your Wacom tablet. So on the back side, there's also a few USB ports on the back. So wherever you find a space to plug this in, either on the side or on the back, let's see. So if you, if you plug these in, you might get a pop-up says allow something you will you want to say yes plug mine in plug mine in to my cable here i might see a pop up on the device that says allow usb debugging i want to say yes i believe Oh yeah, so mine says 
use USB for transfer. If you see it right there on the camera, use USB for transfer. I want to say yes. You might also see another one that says use USB for charging. And there's a, a la always allow. I want to turn on always allow. And then OK, so you see on my device here. On your device, it'll probably also show, I don't know if this is backwards for all of you, but um, on your own Android, it, it'll probably be something very, very similar. So I want to turn on always allow so it doesn't ask me every time. And then I'll click OK. Now, you might not see any of that on your device until you do what I had here on the, on the, uh, on the chat about enable this mode. So if none of that happens when you first plug it in, you're not in the right mode. You have to follow the steps here of enabling this mode. We're enabling the USB debug your device. So once you activate that on your device, then you plug it in. It should then give you those pop-ups of, are you want to connect? Are you sure you want to connect? You click OK. Is it is it then going to do the USB charging? You want to say allow always and click OK. And then it's connected. You will fully know that this works on the next step over here. When I go back to my project, I'm going to go back to the file air settings, deployment. Now at the bottom, install app, turn that on. It might take a moment to refresh itself. You might have to press refresh right there there we go on mine it did pop up there with the serial number of this device maybe on the device itself it might have popped up one more are you sure you want to connect you want to click okay of course so then i want to say install my app on the connected device start it when i when i publish it and what device the one that's plugged in so I guess in theory, you could have more than one device plugged in. You have to select which one. At this point, I'll click OK. Then I'll go to Save to lock those settings in. And I'll go back to, back to the, uh, those settings. Back to deployment. Now, it's... I'm telling it where to go once it gets published. And if I were to try to publish, it's going to give an error first. Certificate must be selected. OK, one more step here. The certificate. One can be an app programmer, but you have to have a little bit of a credential. The good news is that you don't have to get this credential like you have to pay for it or anything. You can create one right here. Adobe Animate has a built-in create certificate feature. This will give you a special file. This file is sort of your ID that I'm the, I'm the creator of this app. So before I try to actually publish it, I need a certificate. No problem. I'll create one right now. Let's try this. Click Create. There's a bunch of things to fill in. They all kind of make sense. Publisher name, organizational unit, organization name, country passwords, validity, etc. Okay, publisher name. Here is your name, the programmer, the creator of this app. It doesn't have to be a real name. This is not going to be saved anywhere in the cloud or whatever to verify with your ID. Any name is fine. Your name probably is the correct name to put here. Organization's name, maybe I have, you know, John Apps Inc. Whatever name you want here, you could have an example, anything that you want as your, um, as sort of like the name of your company. Now, all of these things will not be changeable after you create them. That's okay. You can create as many certificates as you want. Um, obviously, if you're going to be a real game designer, programmer, and so forth, this certificate that you create is important that you keep it safe. You remember its password because you're not going to be able to change any settings on this file. It's it's a locked file for security and and um, uh, 
or proof and such. So be aware that none of this can be changed after the fact, but you can create as many as you want. Organizational unit is just a fancy name of job title. So maybe programmer or CEO or, you know, whatever you want to uh, call these things here. And then so... your company located in what's your password confirm your password so some password cannot change the type of encryption how long will the certificate last the default is fine 25 years that's fine where am I saving this file to? So if, you, if you're creating this file right now permanently for keeps, this is me, the programmer, yeah, browse it, save this file. If you're just learning this, you can create multiple ones of these files that doesn't matter. So I have to go browse. I'm gonna save it somewhere on my project folder. It'll be something.p12. It's a P12 certificate file. So call this whatever you want dot p12 save it somewhere everything looks good here again there's no way to make changes after the fact there's also a help file you can go look at at some point uh, if you know japanese i guess and then you can click okay it'll process it it'll calculate it it'll make a self-signed certificate Project folder, it's P12 file. So this is a personal certificate file credential, which when you, when this game is complete, this certificate will say, yes, this is my app, this is my game. I'm the creator of it. When you make multiple games in the future, when you make future games, this certificate says, yes, I'm the creator of that game because it's got your password and such. And further here, okay, this is the, if I were to start a brand new file, a brand new game file, I would go back to these settings and I would say, here's my certificate. I would not create a new one for every game. I would use my main certificate. You could create as many as you want, but you want your certificate connected here. You want it to remember your password so you don't type it every time and then type your password here. All of these settings here, you probably set them one time when you first create your project. And then when you're going to finish your project, you look at these settings one more time, make sure everything is set properly. At the moment, I'm not going to set any icon. That'll be later. But we did set permission internet to be able to connect to the device. We have a language set. Can make any changes there on the general features of the device and what's most important under deployment well i've got my device plugged in it's going to launch on that device i put my certificate in there password i'll click okay i'll click save like okay you want to click save to lock this in come back one more time you're going to do this over and over Yes, you could do all seven things at once and then click the final OK, but I kind of feel safer. Make a change to one of the screens, click OK, then save. Go back to the screen, make another change, click OK, then save. Come back. I don't know. I'm kind of paranoid that way. But in this case, it's happened sometimes that you're making all these setting changes and maybe you don't click save OK at some point and then it crashes and all that you did got lost. So if you save for each one of these spots, you lock in your settings. Back to settings. Look at it one more time. Perfect. Deployment, let's publish. This usually takes a while, even on a brand new high-tech computer. This is processing a bunch of stuff behind the scenes. It's also going to check your password. It's going to compile the code. It's going to create the supporting files. It's going to look for your device. It's then going to pass it to you, the device. I see something happening on my, on my device now. Now it's popping up here on my device now 
it worked right here. I've got my project working. Got it right there working. Yeah. Doesn't do anything except spin on its own. It doesn't let me drag it or touch anything. It doesn't do anything except that the project has now been deployed to a device. There was a bunch of setup that we needed to do and more to learn, of course. But this is a big step that you need to know how to be able to do. It's the most impressive, of course, if you can do it there at home. You know, here I'm showing you on my webcam. So my project that was on my phone there, I mean, on my computer, it's on my phone, on my device. It's locked into portrait orientation. If I go landscape, it doesn't change. Okay, let's see about that. Let's say this project, I actually wanted it to be a, a landscape game. I want to have the wide game to be able to actually play it. If it's vertical, my game is not a vertical kind of game. I want the landscape game. Okay, in order to do that, general, I need to set this to landscape. And I need to change the dimensions of the file. People make this mistake all the time. They set this to landscape, but never change the pixels. And then when they publish it, the game is, is landscape, but then the left and the right are empty because it's still showing it vertically, but landscape at the same time. So make sure you set this to landscape. Let's click, okay. Let's go to the properties of the file here and we need to switch these around. For a vertical project, 480 wide, 800 tall, we need to flip these around. Uh, it doesn't look like there's an easy sort of flip icon here. You have to type it manually. So we'll, we'll flip those around. Width of 800, height of 480. 800 by 480. Center. Maybe something will um, sort of move around somewhere on your screen. Move it around if you want, although what's going to happen is also the, the position of the tween is going to change. It's fine, whatever. The point here is in the Android settings, I have to set landscape. And in the properties of this project, I have to set landscape dimensions. Just flip them around. File, settings, publish. I would say, click the home button on the device. I would say be, be, be on the home screen of the device, then publish. That way you're sure that the latest version is being uploaded. Sometimes you didn't notice any difference. Now, if you are on the home screen, then click publish, you'll see that it deploys the latest version. And this time it started up landscape. And so now I see my project here, landscape. Try to put it vertically. It's not vertical, it's locked landscape. Eventually, when we do set up our full game, it, we will go in landscape mode just to kind of give you a more expansive view of the game. But the default is portrait. So that seems to be working so far. I'm gonna click the uh, home icon on my Android to just go back to the home screen. Uh, I'm gonna make one more little quick change to my graphic here. Just again, just some changes inside of the um, symbol just so that I have something different. Uh, publish under the settings is one way to see my results, my device. The other way is also up on control menu, control, test movie on device, should show there, test movie on device, 
with your particular device. If you don't see it, you can click refresh. So I'll try it this way, just as an alternative on device on that device. Difference here is that this is this will be a shortcut. The first times will be slow, but then the next times will be fast. I'll show you what I mean here. So I'm seeing my my results on on the phone. Okay, great. When I go back to home, the shortcut. What I mean is, once you've selected control test on either the simulator or the device, notice a check mark appears on one of those two. When it was on mobile launcher simulator, the check mark was there. But now that I've said go to the device, check mark is there. So the shortcut now is what, whatever I've set that check mark to. Now I can do simply on the top corner here, test my movie, and it'll remember your last thing. And now there it's going to go back to the device or the simulator. So by going up to the file menu settings, there's a publish button there with a bunch of other settings, but it's a few clicks. Click file menu, click settings, click publish. Okay, three clicks. But if you do the control method here and it remembers, then from now on, just pressing that one click on test there or keyboard shortcut, control enter. Test movie. It'll automatically deploy it to the device. And maybe if that's even slower, every time on the device, well, going to the um, to the control test on simulator might be a little faster than going to the device. Maybe it'll be a little faster. Because from here, I have, under the touch and gestures, I have the activate touch layer. So then now I can actually interact with it. It's not intractable yet, but when it's on a real device, I'll be able to tap it and actually do stuff with it, right? Well, at the moment, maybe it's just faster to test it on the simulator, turn on the touch layer, and then I can actually interact with it. Well, interactivity comes in two ways, either programming with code commands or using the built-in commands. Animate to get you started has a bunch of built-in commands that you just kind of drag and drop and use them and they work fine. Or if you know any amount of programming, you can program. If you know JavaScript, if you take any web design class, you often learn JavaScript there. Action script is sort of like the cousin of JavaScript. The commands will be very similar if you took any JavaScript class. And Adobe Animate has the ability to write either JavaScript or ActionScript. Uh, usually, if you're dealing with web based projects, you're going to use ActionScript or JavaScript. If you're going to do games for devices, you're going to do ActionScript. And so we have ActionScript capabilities here. Um, let's look a little bit at that. So I've got a layer one. Let me rename that just to call it character. Rename your layer character. Lock it. Get a new layer. But actions, capital A. Actions this is going to be your code layer where we can program it to do something. Interactivity. It's common practice, like I said previously, if you've got a music layer. Put it at the bottom just so that you can find it quickly. You might have 50 layers. I need to find my soundtrack, my background music, whatever layer is called, but it's at the bottom to find it easily. It's common practice for your code layer actions to be at the very top. When, it, when you do the automated thing, it will automatically put it at the top. You can put it wherever you want, but it's best to put it as the first layer because when you've got 50 layers to work with, you'll find it easily it's at the top. For the window menu, we have actions. 
nine. Let's open up our actions panel. This brings up a brand new panel. You probably want to resize it at some point to give you more space and such. What this panel is all about is where code is going to be typed here. And this is showing, oh, there's some code here. This is on scene one. This is on your actions layer. This is on frame one. My actions layer was called, for example, code. This will say this is this code has been written on your code layer on frame one. If I had some frame on some layer and some code, it says there on your code layer, on your layer named code on frame one, you've got some code. On your layer, frame 10, you've got some more code. I had multiple scenes. And on scene two, on some layer, I had some code. This side panel here is very useful to be able to go find all of the code you've, you've added to your project. And every frame can have code, every scene can have code. You can lose track of it all very easily, but this helps you on this side panel here of the code of the action script panel. By clicking on these, you also jump to that place. Right now I'm currently on scene one, but I just quickly wanna to jump to scene two. I don't need to go select, okay, go to scene two and then go to the layer. No, I can click directly there and it'll jump me to the particular scene and layer and frame and everything. For the moment, I'm just kind of showing things quickly. I don't actually need a new scene yet. So I've got those two. And everything else that I did here, I don't really need any of this yet either. This is just some quick stuff. I'm just deleting everything. So within this actions layer, frame one, I'm gonna type the first command here, stop parentheses, semicolon. So this is, this is the first command here, stop. It's written a very specific way. This is correct. This is not correct. This is also not correct. Notice it's blue. Any commands that are correct, valid, real commands will be blue. Things that are not recognized commands will not be blue. What I've done here beyond just writing a little bit, let me take this away. What I've done here is also I've added a comment. So a double slash and then text is a little comment, a little bit of a message or a note for myself. The computer will ignore this. It won't even pay attention to it, that double slash. Now it does have to be slash slash, forward slash, not slash, space slash, and then text. That's not correct. That's not a comment. There must be no space in between those two. See how it grays out. These color codings are important. They kind of tell you something is right or wrong. And right there with that space in between, it doesn't recognize it as a comment. So actually, maybe before I wrote that first command, I put a double slash and say, this is a comment, double slash. It is deactivated or ignored and not valid code. I could create these comments on their own lines. I could create them at the end of the line. This command stops the timeline. I don't know what that means, but that's what it does. 
And so comments are very useful when you're programming because they are little notes for yourself or for other people on the team. If you're working with multiple people and everyone's looking at the code, here's a way to add notes. It's double slash starts a single line comment. A single comment. I'm gonna write comments because I'd have to write double slash comment, double slash comment, double slash comment. And if you get if you get one, you get an error. Well, you can instead do it this way, forward slash asterisk. This is a multi-line comment. It runs on many lines, asterisk slash. Sort of a mirror. Forward slash asterisk, comments, asterisk slash, end. Start of the comment, end of the comment. And notice it also shows you a little icon. All of this is a comment. No need to write the double slash at the beginning. This is not what you do. This is a little time saver. You have to have a start and then end it and end it the right way. If you do the same thing like this, that's wrong. This one means start a comment. This one means start a comment. Nope, in this case, I need end a comment. It's backwards. Start and end. This is often also useful. Instead of typing multiple single lines, I type one big block of multi line. All right, so this command stops the timeline. Going to either run this on my real device or run this on the simulator. I'll just do it on the simulator. It's a little faster. Test movie on my simulator. Or spinning. Let me run this on my device. This one takes longer. That's why on the simulator might be faster. But the point of this is this code stop does exactly that. My timeline had 50 frames of animation. And a moment ago, we saw that when we published our project, it started up on the, here it goes, it started up on the, um, on the device. And then it, um, started to animate and move and whatever, whatever that I made it do. That's what I told it on the timeline, take 50 frames to rotate. But I said, wait a minute, frame one of my project, scene one, stop. Don't actually do anything on the screen yet. I've commanded it to stop at this point. Maybe I want to press a button and then have it move. Here's where this interacti interactivity is coming. By default, everything we've learned so far, it happens on its own. It's passive. Play that walk cycle, play the music, go on your own. This is my animated project, just play it. Interactivity is the next level where I can actually pause, play, rewind, and even with the game, pick up that weapon, uh, move the character to the left, toggle on and off the armor, interactivity. So one of the first things often is don't have this just play on its own, set it up so that I can interact. And to start very, very, very simply, I don't want this animation to happen as soon as the game starts. I want to press a button, and I want the animation to move. I need some setup. I need some clickable thing on the screen, something to tap. Then I need some code that recognizes, hey, that button just got tapped. And when it recognizes the button got tapped, do something, let it play. 
that's building interactivity. So I have a layer for my code, my actions layer. And notice wherever I added code, a little A appears. There's code here. There's action script here. I have a layer for the character to do its thing. I have a music layer. Um, I'll, I'll make a new layer, maybe a buttons layer. Maybe all of, the, all of the interactive buttons are on their own layer. You can set up these projects however you want. Don't be afraid to use as many layers as you want. In one layer will be buttons and another player will, layer will be the, the sprites, the character. Another layer will be the background, especially with interactivity and even passive movement and passive tweening and such, everything should be on its own layer. So on this new layer, I wanna make a button here to click on to play things. So I wanna make a, a button that is like a little square button, super simple. Nothing fancy yet. We can do fancy things later. But that red button, that button right there, I'll, I'm going to tap it so that when this will run in a moment, I'm going to click that to play. My, my first code says stop at this point. But when I tap that, I want it to then play. So this button to be interactive to have it do something similar to this face needs to be a symbol. It needs to be a symbol so that action script can interact with it. So this button that I drew, I will select it and press F8 to convert it to a symbol. It's gonna be a BTN, some button underscore. Button red, button one, button start, button play, button whatever, button go. These things can be called anything you want. It's a movie clip, registration in the center. Okay. Right, so I said a little while ago, you can write code manually yourself if you, if you memorize the various lines of code, or you can uh, use what are known as code snippets, which are like little built-in pieces of code that let you do common things. Let's do it that way instead. I don't have all the code memorized. I'm barely learning, so I don't even know what code to type yet. That's okay. So I code here so far, and there's an icon here, code snippets, which you can also find via window code snippets. This pops up a panel with a bunch of built-in little bits of code that you can use very quickly, which you can also use as a learning tool. So if I open up the action script folder, I've got codes to navigate through the timeline code to affect animation, code for activating the camera of the device, code for the gestures like double tap or three finger tap and whatever. Opening up actions, for example. Okay, click to go to web page. Oh, interesting, I have a button. I can click the button, it'll open a website. I can change the, my custom cursor. Okay, cool, a lot of interesting things. A random number generator right under timeline navigation stop at this frame click to go to frame and stop click to go to frame and play next frame and stop previous frame next scene go to scene and play oh i have codes here how to jump to different scenes and play and so forth now don't do this yet but if i if i um if I double click, you used to be able to preview it, copy, clipboard. It used to show you a preview of it, I think, but you don't see the preview code yet. But again, don't do this yet. If you double click, it'll add the code for you, often with a little comment. 
stop at this frame. The animate timeline will stop and pause at the frame where you insert this code. It can also be used to stop, pause the timeline of movie clips. Interesting. So I'm going to undo that. And um, instead, I want a different code. But what I'm showing is that you have all of these code, like, OK, get the camera, zoom in, et cetera. But in my case, I want to navigate through the timeline a little bit. All of these codes help you do things. Click on something to go to some frame and then play. That sounds about right. At the moment, my project starts on frame one and it stops right there because the code says stop. What I want is to go to frame two and then keep playing. That's exactly perfect what I need right there. Click to and go to frame and stop. When you hover over these things, I might give you a little hint. Click the op Clicking the object moves a playhead to the specified frame then stops or plays or whatever. So it gives you a little bit of a preview of what it does. And some of these, like let's say I were to select, okay, that's the one I want, go to frame and play. If I double click that, it'll say, this action requires an object to be selected on stage first. Okay, I want to click that button. Then I want it to go to a frame and play. That's what it's trying to tell you. So some codes will just be added directly to the project and they'll just work. And other codes, you need to, sell, you need to have a thing to interact with, a movie clip, then you attach the code to it and it'll do what it needs. So make sure that that's been turned into a symbol. Selecting it, I can then double click it, click to go to frame and play. So here's another thing. The selected symbol requires an instance name. Animate will create an instance name before applying. So this helped me here, but it's telling you this also needs an instance name. I'll come back to that in a moment. It's okay, great. You did it for me. Click okay. This is what it says here now. Click to go to frame and play. Clicking on the specified symbol instance moves the playhead to the specified frame in the timeline and continues playback from that frame. Used on the main timeline or in a movie clip. Okay, so that's making me think. If I had a movie clip with my character walking, it's going to play on its own, but I, it says I can also add code in a movie clip. So maybe if I set this up that the character is walking along until it gets to a certain point, then it stops walking, maybe by adding in a stop command somewhere in a movie clip. It won't loop over and over and over to think about. Instructions, replace the number five in the code below with the frame number you would like the playhead to move to when the symbol instance is clicked or tapped. So there's a bunch of coded rights for us. I'll come back to that in a moment. There's a further bunch of code here. It looks very complex, but here's the important part. Go to and play five. Go to some frame and then continue to play the project, frame five. Well, in my case, I, I just needed to go to frame two. I needed to get past the stop to frame two and play because what's happening behind the scenes whenever I test the movie, it starts on frame one and automatically starts to play. But the first thing it encounters on frame one is stop. So I just wanna get past that. And let's say later I add a command on 10. Let's say I didn't have the stop on frame one. Let's say I had the stop 10. The project starts. It keeps going, 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 goes to 10. It sees stop, so it stops. Wherever there's code in the timeline in its own frame, it'll do that code. In my case, it stops right away. And then I'm waiting for a click. Movie clip one. Listen for a click, comma, when we detect a click, do more code. More code is right here. What this more code is, go to and play somewhere. Frame two, change that to a two. We just wanna get past this first stop, frame two, and let it play. It knows that this is the thing being clicked. It says, movie clip one, 
listen for a click, do stuff. That is movie clip one. Remember a moment ago it said, your movie clip should have names. We've given one for you. If I wanted my own name, it's under properties over here, right here. This movie clip has some name. It gave it to me, movie clip one. If I wanted this to be called red button, we'll change that in a moment. Don't change it yet. But it, this is where I would add it. All of my objects need to have a unique name so that the code knows what to connect itself to. This code knows to connect itself to something called movie clip one to do the rest. We'll change this in a moment, but I'm just breaking down what's happening. This object has an instance name so that the code knows what to attach itself to, to then know what to do. All right, great, let's save that. Either deploy it to your device or run it on the simulator. I'm gonna go on the device. It's a little bit more impressive that way. So on the device here, control, test on USB. It does take the longer, so I'll wait a moment. But you're gonna have these things on the screen, a sword, some armor, a new path to take. You're gonna interact with what's on the screen, go to the left path, click on the left door, then code will do stuff. So here it is. So in my case, no motion is happening because that's exactly what it's programmed to do. Stop as soon as the project loads. Now wait for, listen for a click on some object. Tap it and then it plays. Those of you there at home, the project is stopped. I click the play button, it plays. It stops again. Yes, because that's how it's programmed. It's going to load up for the first time. It's going to hit that code, stop. And then it's going to go to the end. What happens when a scene runs out? It goes to scene two. What happens when you get to your final frame? It loops back to the beginning. When it loops back to the beginning, there is a stop. And therefore, it sees the stop, so it stops. So that's what it's doing. When I press play, it's going two frames and it stops. If this were taking more frames, It stops on the first frame. It waits for interactivity. I press the play button. So it's it goes and goes and goes. It goes to the third second. It ends at the end there, loops back to the beginning where it hits the stop again. It's the part about the speed of it all. If you want to, if you have the time, if it's if it's no big deal, you're going to be editing code, you're going to be saving it, you're going to be publishing it, and then it's going to be this moment. Yeah, it's 10 seconds, 15 seconds, and in, the, in a whole day, 10 seconds is nothing. But as you're working, wow, 10 seconds again, 10 seconds again. That's why the simulator might be a little bit faster, a little bit more efficient. So anyway, here it is again. I've just programmed in one more second of animation. Press the play. It's animating for one second. The button disappears because obviously I didn't extend it on the timeline. Then it loops back, it hits the stop. Okay, press play. But if I want it to animate until the end, and instead of looping back to the first frame, which will hit the stop. What about if I loop it back to the second frame where there's no stop? So it'll play to the end. It'll jump back to where I tell it frame two, no stop, so it'll play. It'll get back to the end, loop back to two, it'll play. Okay. When it gets to the end of the animation, frame three over here, F7 on the actions layer, wherever there is a keyframe, I can write new code 
it'll do something there. So the playhead will be coming to the end here. I want there to be new code here and the new code will say, don't go back to frame one, go to frame two. See our code snippets. It's there. Timeline. Stop at this frame, click go to frame and stop and play, click to go to frame, click, click, click. All of these say a click. All of these are attached to interactivity. In this case, I don't wanna click on anything to loop back to frame two. I just wanted to do it. This is what's confusing about programming. Even here, when you have snippets, when you have hints of code, not every possibility of what you want is, is available to you, but what you've previously done can often help you to do something in the future. For example, the code I've used so far says, there is some object on screen, listen for it to be clicked. Once it's clicked, do more code. More code is here. And then the actual command is go to and play two. The actual command to actually move it is go to and play two. But that doesn't happen until you click the button. But I want this to happen on its own. Get to the very end and just loop to two. That's the secret there. I need the go to and play two on, on my final frame. So in this case, I can write it manually. On frame, on, on your third second, say comment on its own. Back to frame two and play. Two, capital A and play, capital P, parentheses, semicolon. Notice as you're typing it, it might also pop up to give you hints. When you use this command, we expect there to be a frame You want a scene, scene two, for example, I don't have a scene two, and then semicolon and then end. That's not what I'm trying to do at the moment, but it's telling me the, as I'm typing it manually. So you have these code hints, these snippets that will let you do things commonly quickly. If you're writing the code manually, it'll also pop up to give you hints. And in my case, what I want here is that without any interactivity, the other code was wait for a button to be clicked and then go to frame two. Since this is not inside of any other of that interactive code, it'll just do it. As soon as the uh, playhead reaches frame 72, it'll read this. Okay, don't loop back to one, loop back to two. Save that, that. It's loading up on my device. It starts up, nothing happens. I press play, it starts to move. It's gonna hit that final code and then jump back to frame two and keep looping. It's not gonna get stuck on the stop. It's gonna loop back frame two. I say, okay, okay well, I wanna stop it now. How can I stop it? I never programmed it to stop it by pressing a mouse or a finger click. This will remind us computers are dumb. You have to tell them everything you want. We've only told it three things. Stop when the, when the project begins, wait for a click to then play, and then loop it to two. If we want to program it a further stop and start, that's more code, 
if I want to program it, okay, let it loop three times and then stop, that's more code. If I want it to play a sound when it gets to the end, that's more code. If I want it to get points every time it starts, that's more code. This is a big world where anything you want to do if you program it to do it. And in most languages, there's like, just to pick a number, 200 codes. We don't need to know all 200 codes. Maybe we need to know 5, 10, 15 codes and put them all together. It's like a recipe. You can take the same flour, sugar, and eggs. And if you mix it in a certain proportion, you get pancakes. If you mix it in another proportion, you get tortillas. If you mix it in another proportion, you get, um, what's another one, uh, crepes. Right, if you mix it in different proportions and also you add a little bit more salt here, a little bit of sugar there, a little vanilla here, the same basic ingredients come together to make different things. A game, an interactive project can be often the same five, 10 different codes just mixed in different ways. For the moment, I'm not going to stress about what about this, what about that? Today was just a getting used to, okay, we need a new type of project file an air project file. I need to download the air SDK on my home computer. Okay, then I need to make a file. I need to check the settings of the file. I need to understand those various settings. I have a little bit of a taste that now I'm gonna to start to look at code for interactivity. I can write the code manually. I can use as hints. We come back next time, we'll, but we'll learn even more code and we'll see relatively quickly, we can make an interesting kind of interactive project. Again, you're not gonna make the next uh, real time strategy game or an MMO and such. You're gonna make an interactive project that shows off your character, maybe after their to be continued of your movie. Well, what's the next thing? Now you're gonna tap and move through the scary forest and pick up that branch and the drawbridge comes out and all that stuff. I'll show examples of students next time, uh, what they did. And we're gonna spend time with the coding here. Some of it will be code snippets. Some of it will be original code. And we'll make this interactive project. So back on Wednesday to further learn this stuff. I'm gonna end the recorder at this point. Do some lab time if you want. We'll be back on Wednesday.